Father, I pray today that your presence will just come around us and help us. And for that, we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. Lord, we've been just, uh, folks, we've just been talking about the blood of Jesus, the, the body of Jesus, what God has done for us. It's amazing. But, you know, God has got a will for your life. How many people know that God's got a will for your life? You're not here just to, to make up a number. You're not here just to, to fill a seat. You're not here for any other reason but for God's word to get on the inside of you and for the will and the plan that God has for your life will be revealed. I spoke the other day about the Bible being like a window that we look into. Unfortunately, most people, all they got was the window that had the, what do you call them? Vanilla slices in. <laughs> and all I heard was about the vanilla slices and actually somebody gave me a vanilla slice and uh, I really tried to fight it off bravely, but I took it home and I opened it up. And uh, as I bit into it, it started to explode all outside. And uh, yeah. <laughs> but the whole purpose was that we look into the Bible. That's the window that we look into to show us what God has available for us what God has already prepared for us, what God has already done for us, and, and so as that we can, that, that he's given them to us so freely. So to find the will of God for your life, that is the plan of God. And I want to just share a few things about that this morning. I believe that the Word and the Spirit reveals God's will for your life. The Word of God and then the Spirit by revelation and usually what you do is if you find out something that you really, really want to do. I've heard so many people when they're trying to explain God to people. They, and I can remember as a young Christian, people would say to me, whatever you do, don't tell God you want to go to Hawaii because he won't send you there. So I started saying, God sent me to India and he did 14 times. Because I didn't want to go to India. <laughs> but that's not God. God is not, he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And some people get these strange ideas and strange thinking and, and they tell you things as a young Christian and somehow or other that gets in your mind that don't ask God for anything good because he won't give it to you. I want to tell you, my God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. He wants to bless us with all spiritual blessings. He wants to give us abundantly more than we could even imagine or think. Our God is a good God. Amen? And so, you know, we've just got to be careful what we hear and what, how we think. But the Word of God and the Spirit will reveal God's Word to you. Jesus, the Son of God, was and is the express image of God. I believe that that's what the church should be. We should be that express image. Jesus was the express image of God the Father, and he came to do the will of his Father. What I've got to understand is also that his Father is also my Father. Some of those kids at a camp mostly had a bad relationship with the Father. Or, or, or some man in their life. So when they come to God, it, it makes it difficult to enter in. But the father that Jesus had is my father. He is a good father, amen. He, he wants to bless me. He wants to help me. He wants to be my friend. He wants to do everything that's good for me. That's which Jesus says is what the father says. What Jesus says on this planet is what the father says. What Jesus does is what the father does. In John 5, verse 19, it says, The Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever God does, the Son does in like manner. The Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever God does, the Son does in like manner. I believe that the church does have to get up off our blessed assurance. We've got to get up out of our thinking that we've just come to church to, to come and sing a few songs and, and have somebody perhaps bore us for an hour and then go home and feel somehow or other that we've paid our debt 
to God. Because I've gone to church. Friend, God wants us to be the church. I don't go to church. I am the church going to a place. We are the church going to a place. I am not going to the church. Although we use that phrase. We are the church coming to a place. What did Jesus do when he was on this planet? He came to save those that were lost. He came to heal the sick, to minister deliverance to those who are bound. Uh, He forgave sin. He cast out devils. He raised the dead. He fed the hungry. He really revealed the Father's heart. And, And friend, so many people today will not go to, you know, they don't want anything to do with church because they've seen Christians. I believe that somehow or other God has got to get inside of us that we understand that we are representing Jesus Christ. We are God's image. God wants to flow through us. Just like Joe was speaking this morning about the communion. We know that we hold a cracker, but it's what it represents. The power in what it represents. And he says, do this in remembrance so you remember what I did for you, how I paid a price to set you free from sickness and disease. I shed my blood so as that you do not have to go to hell. I shed my blood so as that because the wages of sin is death. And all of us have sinned and shall fallen short of the glory of God. But our God says, I want you to understand that I paid that price in full. That's why I throw my hands in the air, because I needed the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, to wash over me. I needed to be cleansed. I needed the power of God. And God has given us everything that pertains to life and to godliness. And He wants us to understand that today, He just doesn't want a bunch of people coming in and out like a bunch of, like seaweed going in and out with a tide. He wants a bunch of people that will get enthused and empowered by the Holy Ghost, that will go out there and do what Jesus did, because He said, the things that I did, you can do also. The things that I saw my Father do, I do. The things that I do, you can do. Amen. That's what it's all about, and that's what we're about. Amen. Doing doing something like that. There was a woman there in John 8, verse 3, that was caught in the very act of, of adultery. But see, Jesus forgave her. He had the power to forgive sins. And, and what an amazing thing. Uh, and, you know, this, this woman really should have been stoned. But instead of that, he, he started to write because the people said she should be stoned. But then he started to write in the, in the sand. I don't know what he might have been writing. He might have been writing the sins that they'd committed. And then he said this, this thing. He said, you that haven't sinned, throw the first stone. And one by one, they left. And then Jesus stood because he was the only one there. You know what? Jesus was the only one that had the right to throw the stone. He was the only one there that hadn't sinned. He was the only one there that could have said, okay, that's what it says. That's what it is. I can throw the first stone and I condemn you to death. But I thank my God that Jesus come to save those who are lost. He come to wash us clean by his precious blood. But he said something to that woman. He said, woman, where are your accusers? And she said, none, my Lord. And he said, neither do I. But then he said something that most people forget. But go and sin no more. Friend, that is not a license to sin. We just can't come every Sunday and and have the communion and, 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 and get delivered and set free. God wants us to live free from sin. But if we do sin, we've got one we can come to. Amen. If we do fall short, if something does happen in that way. But here we go. So this woman was caught in adultery and Jesus forgave her. There's a woman whose son had died and they're walking down the funeral procession and the woman was weeping and she said, oh my Lord. And, and, and Jesus stopped the funeral procession, opened up the box, delivered the young man from death and gave it back to his son, to, to the mother. That's who our Jesus is, amen. He's not one that comes to hurt you, to destroy you. Paul, in his writings to the different churches, was desperately, and I, and I, and I can I, I sense that there's an urgency, there's a, 
I don't want to say desperately, but it's like that, that God is wanting to desperately get the truth of who he is and who you are into us, amen? To raise us up. There's a, and Paul in his writings desperately wanted the different churches to understand who they were and what they were. In his writings to the different churches, he was right, uh, wanting them to know that God himself had given the Holy Spirit to empower them and not to just rely on their own ability, but to believe God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I want to read this to you, amazing verses of Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It says here, and it says, And I, brethren, when I come to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith would not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Here is Paul desperately wanting to, these people to understand that they, he didn't come with an ability in the natural. Now, you've got to understand Paul. Paul wasn't a, a person there that was uh, uneducated. He had a great ability. He was one there that had gone to the chief uh, priests. He was one there that had gone to the authorities. And he spoke because he had a passion. He had a desire to, to, to destroy the church of God. And he got to those people there and he'd raised up a great number. He was actually one of the great leaders of his time. He was a man of great natural ability. And I want you to understand what he was trying to say here. He really was saying, I am a man with natural ability, but I put that down because I wanted Christ to come forth in me. I wanted this not to be a demonstration of my ability, but a demonstration of God's ability. I want your faith not to be in me, but in what God can do for you. A lot of people today follow a man or they follow a ministry or they follow somebody that's got an anointing. Friend, I want to tell you, don't be followers of men, be followers of Christ. Because He is the only one that will not let you down. He is the only one that will not turn you away. And Paul, with that natural ability, he, he had a, letters of authority he was going after. He had a great army of people following him, great, um, a group of people there that were actually taking the Christians and putting them into prison, doing horrible things to them. But Paul now, because of his great conversion, because of, of now of his understanding, his realization of, of the natural man and the natural ability, he says, I want your faith to be in God, not in my ability. Amen. In Ephesians 1.16, Paul again, these are, these are great scriptures and I believe you know most of these off by heart, but I just want to remind us today as we look at these, as these scriptures, Ephesians, it's back this way. How many people like Ephesians? Listen to this, it says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. If ever there's a time in the history of the church, it's right now that we need to have a revelation and a knowledge of who He really is. Amen? Amen. Listen, this is Paul, and, and I want you to get this, Paul, understand Paul was a man of great natural ability. Great natural ability. But here he is, he's saying, I, I want you to realize something. I, I want you to, Ephesians, where am I? <laughs> Heard of your faith. Do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to who? You, the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. 
And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? Can you, Paul is, is wanting to, to somehow or other break through the, the mindsets of man. You know what stops people? It's their mindsets. If you don't think you can do it, you'll never do it. If you don't think you're worthy, you'll never be worthy. But I praise God that Jesus Christ has made us worthy. Hallelujah. He's washed us. He's cleansed us. He's made us whole. And here, here is these, this man praying this prayer. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Everybody say mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. In other words, God wants you and I to be the fullness of Him. Amen? If you're following a man, all you'll be is a good copy of that man. But I want to follow Jesus, hallelujah. And, and I want to have the fullness that God has made available to us. And it says, you, He made alive who are dead in your trespasses and sins who once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. What an amazing thing. In Galatians chapter 3, 1 to 3, we find here Paul talking to the Galatian church. And the Galatian church are a bunch of people that started off in the realm of the spirit and the power of God. And there's great manifestations in their life. And, and Paul comes and says, Who? Who has beguiled you? Did you not start in the spirit? Why now have you gone back to the flesh? Why are you going back to your old ways? Why are you going back where you're relying on yourself? Friend, I want to tell you, we've got to come to a place where Jesus, He is the Lord. He is a King. Amen. He is a rewarder. He is a one there. If you can diligently seek after Him, He will reward you. Amen. As there's something that, God, that Paul is stirring up in the hearts of people here. He's trying to get them excited. He's trying to get them to get back to the, to the thing. And, and, and there in, in Galatians 5.1, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where Christ has set us free. Friend, I want to tell you, I believe that the church of the living God that we're serving, God is going to start to raise us up in a mighty way. I believe the power of God. I, I honestly believe the manifestation of God is going to be seen in the church. It's not just the older people or whatever it might be, but all of creation. All those that call upon the name of the Lord, the power of God is going to flow through us. I believe for children in school where they'll start laying hands on their kids and on their mates at school, where the power of God will come and, and touch them. In 93, we had a move of the Spirit of God that I, I tell you what, it was a, such an awesome thing. People were laughing and people were, were crying and people were just getting slain in the Spirit. You could just, the anointing was coming down on people in such an amazing way. But one of the great things that happened in that, in that move of God was it touched the children. The children were coming. They were bringing their parents to church. They were, the, they were being touched in the school. And our own granddaughter, I remember one day there, as, as she was laying on the floor and Nancy was sitting beside her, and as the anointing of God was just flowing over that place and people's lives were being touched, my little granddaughter, I think she was about eight or nine at the time, she said to Nancy, she said, oh, Jesus just took out my black heart and gave me a new heart. That little girl and the rest of the kids there, they'd go to school and they'd sit in the classroom and all of a sudden they'd just get slain in the spirit. They'd, they'd be carrying kids down to the office and Brian, um, Sarah's uh, dad, they'd say, come and get your daughter. <laughs> but friend, there has got to come a move of the spirit of God. It's going to touch the children. It's going to touch us, Amen. Where, where the anointing will flow through our lives, where the power of God will be made manifest. Friend, people won't just come to church if all we're doing is singing a few lullabies and having a, a little morning massage, I mean message. God, 
I believe God wants to demonstrate. That's what Paul was saying. I didn't come to you with excellence of speech or with man's wisdom or whatever it is, but I come in the power of the Holy Ghost. Oh, glory to God. I don't know about you, but I'm getting hungry for a move of God. I'm getting hungry for an outpouring of the Spirit of God. I'm getting, I, I want to, I, <laughs> Oh, I just want to see God. Amen. I want God to do whatever He wants. God wants to release His plan and purpose for the church today, for your life. Uh, We are a Joshua generation. We had a word from God the other week about that. Remember, Joshua was over 80 years of age when his ministry hit top gear. Caleb was 85 when he said, give me this mountain. Amen. (laughs) He was 85 when, when, when when he said those words. What an amazing statement. What are you saying? What do you say about yourself? Do you say you're too old? I'm just going to leave it to the young people. (laughs) Or are you saying, this is my time? Why don't you say that to yourself right now? This is my time. Amen. This is my time. Give me this mountain. It's mine. (laughs) Give me Mount Coolum. Hallelujah. (laughs) Whatever mountain you can think of. Mount Tachikoi. No, we don't want that one. (laughs) We've got to know the purpose of Pentecost. It was to empower us. Isaiah 40, uh, verse 31. Let's have a look at that. These are good scriptures, amen? (laughs) Isaiah 40, verse 31. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up as on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Look at this. They that wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord. They will rise up. Amen. How do you wait upon the Lord? You entwine yourself. You get around God. Friend, look, it's not going to happen while we just sit around saying, well, if God wants to, he can. Now, I've, I've heard that statement many times. People there that, that perhaps might, might not understand fully may have a, a bit of resistance. Anybody ever found anybody that holds a bit of resistance? Because sometimes what's going on is not necessarily in line with your way of thinking. It may not be the way you've been brought up. It may not be the way you've been taught. If you look at the the early church with Jesus talking there, one of the great problems that they had was that the doctrines and the philosophies and the traditions of the Jews stopped them from hearing that Jesus was the Christ. Because in their own mind and in their own imagination, they had this picture how Jesus was going to come. And they might have had him coming with all pomp and ceremony, trumpets blowing, and goodness knows what else. But when Jesus came, he came in a humble way. He came born in a manger. He came not the way that they thought he would come. And friend, I'll tell you this, with us, it may not be the way we think it's going to happen. But I want to tell you, let God be God. Amen. Let God have his own way. Let God build his own church. Let God do it his way. And I believe that the the resistance is starting to break down. Here we find this this thing. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. We we somehow or other we get into a place where where there's something on the inside of there's a hunger, there's a passion, there's something that we want God. And and God starts to unravel the wrong thinking, the wrong doctrines, the wrong thoughts that we've got in our mind. And all of a sudden he says, I'll open the eyes of your understanding and you'll be able to see the glory. I believe that David had a revelation. He said, as he could see and as he could to hear and as as the spirit of God was working on his life there was something there that, that just captivated him has changed him God wants to break through the thinking the wrong thinking what are you saying about yourself what do you say about yourself what do you think about yourself it's going to really make a lot of difference give me this mountain the purpose of pentecost Got to find out that, you know, we'll rise up as on wings of evil. Eagles, evil. (laughs) 
I pray that we don't miss the real purpose of Pentecost. How do I, do I release this awesome power of God? It's, it's how you speak. It's what we say. It's how we think. Caleb, give me this mountain. The hunger never, ever left him. The passion for that mountain, the desire for that mountain, that, that, that feeling, I don't know, that there's something on the inside of him, though he had been, it seen the, the children of Israel turn away from the promised land. He had watched us, many people, friend, a lot of people in this planet that we live in have been disappointed. A lot of people have seen things there that didn't happen the way we thought they should happen. Other things happened there. Friend, can I say this? Don't let those things stop you. Caleb was a man that had seen such a, so much of the atrocities and, and people doing stupid things, worshipping golden calves and, and, and committing wrong things and doing stupid stuff. He saw a whole generation of people die out, but it never, ever got out of him. The passion, the desire, the, 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 ooh, the grunt there that says, give me this mountain. My God, you're going to build your church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. God, you're going to have a move of the Spirit on this planet. You're going to touch this nation of Australia. You're going to touch the Sunshine Coast. You can touch. But friend, there's got to come something on the inside. It's called a bit of grunt. You can get it milking the cow. You can get it shutting the gate. You can get it washing the dishes. As a matter of fact, I'm getting it now. Are you getting it now? You hang around here long enough, you'll get something. Who? <laughs> the power of God, the presence of God, the anointing of God. Caleb was a man that had, had a passion. It, I think God's looking for a bunch of people with a bit of tenacity yes. that'll come boldly before the throne of grace. Not, oh, I, no, I don't deserve it, God. There's a scripture there, I can't remember where it is, but it says, your prayers weary me. I don't really deserve it. I'm not good enough. What's, what's the blood for? What's the broken body for? What's, what's it all about, amen? If, if God wants to cleanse us and make us whole and we can come boldly before the throne of grace, Caleb, give me this mountain. The hunger never left him. The passion never left him. The desire never left him. Peter and the disciples saw Jesus walking on the water. Why was Peter the only one who walked on the water? Because he asked. Psalm 2 verse 8 says, Ask of me and I will give you the nations or the heathen for your inheritance. Ask of me, ask of me, Luke eleven nine, 9. And I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Friend, if, we're, if we've got there, I don't deserve it. I don't deserve this thing. Like the other day when that lady came up to me with that custard, what, no, not a, what a vanilla slice. There it was, this vanilla slice. I could see it through the transparent packaging. Why don't they put it in a, in a, in a container that you can't see it? Because if you couldn't see it, you wouldn't buy it. <laughs> True? God doesn't hide His Word and what He's done for us. He's put it in a container that you can see. And he wants you to, and I, I, I saw that thing and she walked up to me and she said, I bought this for you. I could have said, oh, I'm not worthy. Oh, I'm not good enough to receive it. Oh, take it away. No, give it to me. <laughs> you should have seen me eating it. It was oozing. It was running. It was nice. Ooh, <laughs> Ask of me, 
ask of me. Don't, friend, Jesus has cleansed us. I know that I was nothing but a worm. I was lost. I was lost in my trespasses and sin. But the Bible says, you who were dead in your trespasses and sin, he has made alive. Hallelujah. And today I have the life of God flowing through me. I got the anointing of Jesus. Hallelujah. I got the gift of God. I've been washed in the blood. Hallelujah. I'll never be the same again. I got a passion. I got a hunger. I got something burning on the Side. People said, people said on Sunday night that they could feel the fire burning in them as Joseph was preaching. They could feel the fire. Feel the fire of God as he preached. What an amazing thing. What an amazing thing. John 14, 14 says, Jesus speaking, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 16, verse 23 says, Jesus speaking, it says, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. You know what I believe the Holy Ghost is doing? He's stirring up deep, deep wells. Stirring up deep, deep wells. Dig again the wells that our enemy, listen to this, and you have filled in. Dig again the wells that the enemy and you and me had to fill in. Stirring up Deep, deep wells. Spring up, a well, within my soul. Spring up, a well, and make me whole. I want to tell you some of these old psalmists wrote some of those old songs. I want to tell you they had something inside of them. They were, they were trying to betray something there of the Spirit of God. There were people there as Paul was writing those things to them. Oh, I pray, I pray since I heard of your salvation, I pray that God would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened that you might know that you might know the power of God that you might know the victory of Christ amen that you might know it hallelujah not just read about it not just talk about it but that you might know it spring up oh well within my soul I want to tell you I get stirred when I talk about when I think about Caleb give me this mountain I can take it hallelujah I get stirred up when I hear Joe when he gets up here and says, I'm 83 and some months. But I want to tell you, there's a fire that's in his belly that hasn't gone out. Hallelujah. There might be an old man out on the outside, but there's an in man. There's a new man on the inside that's being renewed day by day. How do you renew that? They that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They will rise up as on wings of eagles. Hallelujah. They shall run and not be weary. They shall, they shall, they shall. I don't know about you, but I feel a stirring glory to God. I feel a sense of God's presence and God's power getting on the inside of us again, causing us to rise. God will raise up His church, amen. Jesus said, I will have a church that the gates of Hades will not prevail against. I'm gonna have a church that know me, the Lord says. Get to know Jesus, amen. Amen. If you keep your eyes on man, you'll see the failings of man. But get your eyes on Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim. Just while the musicians are coming, let's stand to our feet.